I've been reading again. That means it's time for another book review. 100 Go Mistakes. Oh, sorry. 100 Go Mistakes and How to Avoid Them. Hi, I'm Jonathan Hall. Earlier this year, I did a book review series on the best book to learn Go. Check out the link up here if you haven't seen that. Uh, but I had a lot of requests for other book reviews, so I'm doing some more. This time, it's 100 Go Mistakes and How to Avoid Them. Let's dive in and see if you should read this book. So first off, this book is just 384 pages of 100 Go Mistakes. That's about 3.84 pages per mistake on average. Uh, I guess if you count all the front and back material, it's really less than that per mistake. Um, who's the book for though? In the preface, it says, this book is for developers with existing knowledge of the Go language. Ideally, you have already worked on an existing Go project at work or at home. This is not an introduction to Go. If you need that, check out the video series I mentioned earlier and uh, get one of those books. But if you've already started using Go and you've uh, found yourself potentially making mistakes, uh, this book is uh, designed for you. Now, many of the examples in this book will be immediately useful to brand new Go developers, uh, as long as you have the basics down. Others are more advanced. Some are very advanced even, uh, dealing with like memory layouts and stuff like that. So I'd say there's actually something in this book for almost any level of Go developer, whether you're, uh, you've are you only been doing it for a few weeks or you've been doing it like I have for years. I found several new things in this book that uh, I didn't know about before. Now you can probably guess a little bit about the organization of this book. Uh, there are 100 sections. Uh, you can tell that straight from the title. They are broken into chapters and sections uh, on a sort of topical basis. And some of the sections have a sort of introductory section or sometimes uh, one of the quote problems is, is more an introductory problem, a conceptual problem rather than a code problem. Uh, one example of that would be uh, number 55, uh, mixing up concurrency and parallelism. This mistake to be avoided isn't one per se in the code, so there's not really a code example there, but there's about three or four pages discussing the concepts of parallelism and concurrency and how they're different, uh, so you can avoid that mistake. Then the sections after that talk about code-related problems uh, related to concurrency and how to avoid those mistakes. The organization of this book also makes it an easy reference material. Uh, it's not, of course, a comprehensive reference material, but it's really easy to find a particular mistake if you're dealing with strings or you're dealing with concurrency or memory mapping or whatever uh, it's easy to find that topic in the table of contents uh, and, and jump to the part that you care about you do not need to read this book in sequential order so it's it's an ideal reference sort of material and the short sections make it really easy to read uh, between interruptions if you're reading on the go <laughs> puns are great aren't they if you're reading uh, on your commute or uh, on the toilet or whatever uh, this book can be easily read in small chunks uh, without fear of losing your place or whatever. Let's talk about the prose style in this book. Uh, I like the author's humility. Uh, he kind of right off the bat talks about these are mistakes that in many cases he has made personally. Uh, you know, it's easy to talk about mistakes in a sort of us versus them or me versus you way. Uh, I, if you've ever done a code review, you've probably experienced that. Uh, th this uh, author does a good job of being humble and, and approachable and sort of inviting you to join the group of Go developers who know that they make mistakes uh, so we can all work together to improve our, our Go code. So you certainly don't need to fear judgment when reading this book. At the very beginning of the book, the author says, to be transparent, I was also a decent source of inspiration regarding the mistakes in, in the book. And, and then he just sort of dives in and starts talking about mistakes. So let me just read a, a small section from one of these uh, mistakes uh, to get a feel for the, the tone um, now this particular mistake number 81 is one that I've talked about in one of my previous videos uh, so at least the author and I agree on this one mistake number 81 using the default HTTP client and server the HTTP package provides HTTP client and server implementations however it's all too easy for developers to make a common mistake relying on the default implementations so what's the problem using the default HTTP client first the default client doesn't specify any timeouts the absence of timeouts is not something we want for production grade systems that can lead to many issues and so on and so on. It goes on to explain other uh, problems with the defaults as well. So, you know, it's a very easy, approachable, uh, non-judgmental explanation of the mistakes. Let's talk about the content in the book. Uh, as I already mentioned in the beginning, uh, this is not a complete uh, description of Go or it's not a tutorial. It's really just uh, sort of 100 snapshots of mistakes you might make and how to avoid them. Now the author does break down 
uh, the mistakes into various categories, which helps with the organization and with conceptualizing how urgently you should consider the mistakes. Uh, perhaps the most obvious category would be bugs. Uh, but that's probably a minority of the ones in this book. He also talks about needless complexity, uh, you know, when there's a simpler way to do something. Uh, readability, uh, when you write code in a way that's harder to read versus an equivalent one that's easier to read. Optimization or, or under-optimization. Uh, Non-idiomatic organization or, or confusing organization and others. So, you know, the, the book is broken down into these sections, which makes it easy uh, to, to find what you're looking for or to find what area you care about. Uh, if, you're, if you're concerned about bugs specifically, you can read that section. And then of course, some of these areas are more serious than others. I mean, I, I hope that we would generally agree that fixing bugs is more important than fixing for optimization. And some of the suggestions in this book are even a little bit contentious or, or, or opinionated. And you know, there's nothing wrong with that, but I don't think you should take every mistake and the alternatives as sort of gospel truth. Some of these are matters of opinion, some are contextual. Let me just offer one example. Mistake number 11 is not using the functional options pattern. Uh, if you're not familiar with what that is, uh, there's a link in the description to a great blog post by Dave Cheney that goes into detail. But in short, if you have an object that you want to configure, there are a variety of ways you can do that. One is to pass in a config struct, right? With you know 10 or 15 or 100 different configuration options. Uh, another would be to just take a, a list of arguments as the for the constructor. Some of these work fine in certain contexts, but as you get to a certain point, uh, it becomes very cumbersome. And that's where this functional options pattern comes into play. Now, the book doesn't say that you should always use the functional options pattern, but it doesn't say you shouldn't either. It doesn't really give guidance as to when it makes sense or when it doesn't. It just offers it as, uh, as a pattern and cl claims, perhaps implicitly by the inclusion of the mistake, that you should use it all the time, and I don't think you should. I also don't think the author necessarily believes that either, but it's it's easy to sort of pick that up if you're if you're not careful that maybe it's making a too strong a case for that. So just be aware that some of the patterns in this book uh, you should be aware of them, but you wouldn't necessarily use them all the time. Some of them are contextual. Some of the mistakes in this book also aren't actually specific to Go at all. I'll call out two examples: uh, numbers eighteen and nineteen which are neglecting integer overflows and not understanding floating points. Uh, these are both things that happen in virtually any language, uh, at least the vast majority of languages. Uh, you can have integer overflows. You know, if you're trying to store uh, too much information in a 16-bit integer or a 32-bit integer, you have an overflow. Uh, and floating point numbers are not uh, precise. And uh, that surprises a lot of newcomers. So I'm glad they're in the book. They definitely affect Go uh, developers, but they aren't specific to Go. These mistakes can affect programmers of practically any language. And then finally, I'll talk about the last section of the book, which is about optimizations. I honestly think that most people kind of should ignore this section. Uh, actually, that's not quite true. It's useful to read it and to understand it. But as Donald Knuth is known for saying, premature optimization is the root of all evil. And if you, if you just read this book without applying a proper judgment, you might uh, end up prematurely optimizing parts of your code. Uh, it talks about uh, memory layouts of structs. Uh, it talks about passing pointers versus uh, non-pointers, you know, different things like that. Uh, and, and those are important to understand, uh, especially as you get more advanced in your Go uh, development experience. But uh, it's, it's very easy to get hung up on these details that don't really matter 99% of the time. Uh, so just take that last section with a grain of salt. Use it for your education, but don't necessarily apply all of those rules all of the time. Uh, without without good reason or benchmarks that tell you that you need to improve your performance. Let's talk about the accuracy of the book. Uh, I like to do that uh, when reviewing technical books. So I didn't find any technical factual errors in this book. There may be some I overlooked, but I, I didn't find any. My only disagreements with the book or with the author have more to do with emphasis uh, rather than with substance or with the content. Uh, and as I've already alluded to, some of the mistakes described I would consider to be more opinion than, than hard mistakes. Uh, and some of them depend on context. Now, my strongest disagreement with the book, uh, and it's not even that strong, uh, was with number 12, uh, taught where it's talking about project uh, misorganization. And the book references a popular Go repository on GitHub called Standard Go Project Layout, which you may have seen yourself. I, I disagree with recommending that uh, repository. It is not a Go standard. And as the book points out, Russ Cox from the Go team uh, has criticized this repo and in particular 
criticized its claim to be a standard, points out that there is no Go standard for project layout. Uh, that's very contextual. Some projects need one layout, some need another. Are you building a microservice? Are you building a monolith? Are you building a desktop application? Are you building a web service? Whatever you're building really dictates your layout, not some arbitrary standard that has this uh, repo. So I, I wish that they didn't even mention that repo in the book because I think it's poor taste to promote that repo. But ultimately, I agree with the author's conclusion when he says that the worst layout is an indecisive one. So I do agree that you should have some layout that you're using. Uh, you should have some standard, some method to your uh, project. And that's really the point the author's making. I just wish he had left out the reference to this uh, repo that, in my view, kind of needs to be downplayed. But let's move on. Finally, let's talk about the physical characteristics. Because if you're buying a physical book, um, that might matter. So if you've ever read a book from Manning, you already know what this book is like. 384 black and white pages. There are a few tables, a few diagrams. No color in the book. You don't need color in a book like this. It's a great book physically. Nothing to complain about. What's my conclusion? There's a little bit of something for everyone in this book. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, some of the mistakes uh, any newcomer to Go can pick up immediately and start learning from and improving. Others are more for advanced audiences. I've been programming in Go for close to a decade and I learned some new things in here. And I'm going to improve some of my mistakes after reading this book. So no matter your level of Go experience, whether you're uh, just a few weeks in or you've been doing it for more than a decade, uh, you can learn something from this book, I'm, I'm quite certain. Uh, and it's, of course, if you can even just learn one thing to improve your, your coding, it's worth the cover price. Uh, you'll probably learn dozens of things in this book. And so I do recommend the book. Uh, I think anybody can learn from it. Well, there you have it. You should go buy this book. If you learned something today or you enjoyed the review, please hit the like button. And of course, I'd love for you to subscribe if you're new here to be notified when new book reviews or other videos come out. I hope to see you next time. Until then, make it go.